Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sorting Hat Podcast. I, as always, am your host, Michael Berry, joined by my co-host, Reed Bryce. Welcome, Traveler! Ah, yes, welcome, Travelers, indeed. The very conceit of our show is that we take a theme or topic and based off of our guests' suggestions and knowledge base and sort those things into the various houses of Hogwarts. Today, we are joined by Holly Conrad, who you may be familiar with from her Twitch and YouTube channel, Commander Holly. She is also a avid bird lover and D&D player. Thank you for joining us. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and appropriate to one of the uh, appositives attached to your name is we are going to be sorting arcane caster spells from D&D, which yes. is specific to wizards, sorcerers, and warlocks. Mm-hmm. Very uh, specific. Yes. Uh, Holly, how long have you been playing Dungeons and Dragons? So I've been playing since I was in high school. Yeah. And um, I start, I started playing in high school, but I've, I actually did it like reverse. So I started playing uh, Baldur's Gate, like video games oh, yeah. based in the Dungeons and Dragons world in high school and then realized that there was a tabletop game. And I was like, oh, oh wait, like I could play this more? Like right. there's more of this? <laughs> oh, great. Like the limitations suddenly <laughs> yeah, fade yeah. away and yeah. you're like, I can go deeper? Yeah, exactly. So I played all those games like hundreds of times, like Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 and Neverwinter Nights and all of those. And then I realized that there were books based off of these worlds and I just like devoured them forever. I uh, My first taste of Dungeons and Dragons was actually also one of my first romantic encounters uh, <laughs> in high school. Um, uh, I was what you would describe as a nerd. Uh, <laughs> obviously, things have changed a lot since then. And I was I was a freshman in high school and a dude. Uh, I think I asked him out and we awkwardly dated for about a month. And in that time, he gave me the gift of. The, the Dungeons and Dragons, Dragons starter set. Nice, <laughs> nice. And I was like, I'm like looking back and I'm like, oh, dude, God bless you. I, ho- <laughs> I hope you're getting laid wherever you are now because that, how, how do you think that was supposed to work? <laughs> See, I, I had also been in high school. I had been dating my dungeon master and uh, he was awful. I don't care where he is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... Uh, diving right in because my exposure to D and D is minimal at best. I've played like one short campaign where we were all sort of locked in and we weren't going to level up or anything like that. So I'm probably going to be asking you quite a few, what would be, um, categorizes, I think dumber questions, but, uh, perhaps for the more inexperienced and unexposed to D and D that might prove helpful. So, uh, you had, stressed before we started recording that arcane casting is different than there because there are different magic yeah. users yeah so there's divine casters and there's arcane casters mm-hmm. now divine magic is usually taken from a, a god or a deity who grants the power to the user mm-hmm. and they still come from the weave which is where magic comes from in the in the D like forgotten realms a type weave? universe like it's called a- the weave like like, um, weave. like like a, a wig? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's my weave. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, gotcha. Okay. Exactly. So there's so magic comes from the weave in both cases. Yes, but one comes from from gods. One can, comes from the spells being granted to a user by a divine source mm-hmm. versus someone just taking it. Yeah. So in the case of arcane casting, it's Either thefted or self manifested, I suppose. Yeah, th- like th- thefted, quote unquote, like through books, through mm-hmm. reading, through like spells, through knowledge, or through an innate ability. And then within that subsect, there are wizards, sorcerers, warlocks that can cast arcane magic. Yes, and bards too. I mean, oh, they and can bards. do it. Yeah, they can do it too. But I mean, like whatever. Shakespeare. <laughs> Yeah, they can, you know, they strum their loot and it's just like pew pew or whatever. Gotcha. It's Kubo and the two (laughs) strings sort of situation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So let's dive in um, and and get to our first spell. It is also worth noting that I am a Ravenclaw. Reed is a Hufflepuff and Holly is also a Ravenclaw. So if you are, you loyal listeners are 
concerned as to what our bias is now you know <laughs> i always say that ravenclaws are just the kids at school who are just like oh voldemort's attacking well i have an essay due tomorrow so i'm just gonna keep working on that <laughs> as long as you've like locked the door yeah, yeah. it's all right like they just didn't show up to the big fight they're like well i gotta get good grades because if i don't like i'm gonna feel really guilty yeah, yeah. and hufflepuffs are the ones who do show up to the fight but pee themselves the moment <laughs> it starts <laughs> right they're like, oh, I thought this was going to be a lot more fun than it turned out to be. Not necessarily fun, but they were like, oh, I was hoping a, a peace treaty would uh, happen right. before yeah, this yeah. had to come. Uh, but I'm in it. I'm in it, fellas. Let's do it. Oh, God. <laughs> Let, yeah. Let's do it to let's be ourselves. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Ravenclaws are like, shut up out there. <laughs> I've early class tomorrow. <sighs> Get on this white noise to drown yeah. out the sound of the fighting in the quad. They're playing D&D &D alone yeah. inside. <laughs> All right. So what is our first spell okay. on the docket? So the first spells that you get as a wizard or sorcerer, or, you know, arcane caster are called cantrips and you mm -hmm. can cast those as many times as you want. Mm -hmm. And so they're like a really good way in the game to be really creative and fun because uh, one of my favorite cantrips is called prestidigitation. Mm -hmm. And with that cantrip, you can clean someone's clothes, make something dirty, look like you're holding. Like, I think it's like you can hold like. I think it's like a small object. It's like really like basic, small, tiny illusions and oh. smells. You can manifest a smell. You can mm -hmm. like, like make it like seem like it's like smoking somewhere. It's just like, and it also depends on your DM. Like I can actually read you the description. So it's not just me like spitballing what I remember from mm -hmm. reading the book. <laughs> Um, so the description is you create an instantaneous, harmless sensory effect, such as a shower of sparks, a puff of wind, faint musical notes or an odd odor. You instantaneously light or snuff out a candle, a torch or a small campfire. You instantaneously clean or soil an object no larger than one cubic foot. You chill, warm or flavor up to one cubic foot of non-living material for an hour. <laughs> Don't flavor any people. <laughs> you, make, <laughs> you make a color, a small mark or a symbol appear on an object or a surface for one hour and you you create a non-magical trinket or an illus illusory op image that can fit into your hand and that lasts until the end of your next turn. So that's it's like so that's prestidigitation. Yeah, it's like it's just like was like 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 um trying like a magician magic. It's, it's like magician it's magic. Short range wizardry. And, yes. it, and it doesn't have any long term effects, right? You said it's just no, an illusion. It's up to an hour. It only lasts an hour. And I also like that they made a point. To acknowledge that they are on the imperial system <laughs> right. because it's one cubic foot, yeah. not one cubic meter. No. Exactly. Uh, I I so, realize I that I would probably not be a good wizard because I would have trouble saying half of the things that you have to say <laughs> and and like because I okay hold on here I go press it tis press it di you know what I'm gonna just be an orc mm -hmm. <laughs> well, like I'm just gonna fight I'm yeah. just gonna be a fighter because I can't. I can't speak properly in this universe. So within, so prestidigitation is within cantrips. Yes, it's a spell within cantrips. Um, and are we going to be getting a few other cantrips? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So then, for that very reason, all right, we're going to probably be sorting individual spells and then probably sorting the larger arc of yeah. cantrips as a whole. So this seems very practical in nature. It's short term. It's quick. It's clean for the most part, mm -hmm. unless you're sullying clothes with magic. Right. Um, it strikes me as a bit of a Hufflepuff. Yeah, also in the fact that it's like not, it's not like long-term damaging. It feels like a soft prank yeah. in the universe <laughs> of spells. It's right. like, yeah, uh, oh yeah, I just made you look like, I, I made you look like you don't have a tooth where you do have a tooth. Like that sort of thing. Like yeah. that, It feels very benign, which, which, you know, skews more Hufflepuff to me. It is definitely a soft, like a soft prank and or a good way to run away, which I feel like would be a good Hufflepuff. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, they're non-confrontational yeah. people. I used it in one of my games to make it smell like smoke and I just screamed fire. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's the that's the quick. I immediately was like, drop. oh, I would just manifest a bear and be like, everybody a bear. <laughs> I'm scared. Let's run from the bear. You can only be a foot wide. So, uh, it'd be a so tiny it's a bear. small bear. And it's and even then I think it can only be an object. So you can't really manifest a bear, but you could manifest mm. like a smell of a bear and be like, I smell a bear, guys. I got, Run. There's some bear stink. Everybody get <laughs> yeah, out of yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. I feel comfortable <laughs> in sorting this 
into the realm of Hufflepuff. Mm-hmm. Cool. What, what do we have next? All right, so this one, I love this one. This one is called Mage Hand. And this is also a cantrip. This is also a cantrip, which means you can, these are really great in D&D because you can be really creative with them and because you can cast them as many times as you want. There's mm-hmm. no limit to the amount of times you can cast them. And mm-hmm. they they just, you can just keep doing it. Like, okay, I'm just, here's some more fancy sparks or whatever. Great, great, great. So this is called Mage Hand. And what happens is a spectral floating hand appears at a point you choose within range. The hand lasts for the dur- duration of... I'm oh, sorry, the hand lasts for the duration or until you dismiss it as an action. The hand vanishes if it is even more than 30 feet away from you or if you cast this spell again. You can use your action to control the hand. You can use the hand to manipulate an object, open an unlocked door, container, stow or retrieve an item from an open container, or pour the contents out, blah, blah, blah. So pretty much, <laughs> it's just a hand that you can use to do stuff. And it's... Forgive me. It it's a normal size. Yeah, it's phantom just a hand. hand. Yeah, it's just like a see through like phantom hand. Though if you're in Ravenloft, it's a skeletal hand because that place is messed up. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. And so the hand is a specter, but it can actually like uh, manipulate stuff. Like you said, yes. it can unlock doors. It could like give Man. someone a wedgie. It could like pull their like. I would you know, become so off. much more lazy if I had <laughs> access to this spell. I would not be doing any of my chores by myself. I'd be like. Go, go, mage hand, fold this laundry. Is it a situation where the mage hand require, like, could you just provide instructions to it? And it's like, it gives you like a nod sort of gesture. No, and it's then not goes sentient. Off and does it. Yeah. Oh, no, so you, you have to control it. Yeah. So you're, so in this situation, I guess what you proposed read is not nearly as possible, but you could theoretically stay on the couch, uh, mage hand to grab the remote. Turn on the yes. TV. Yes, hell yeah. And then like, all right, go away, mage hand. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's coming back to Harry Potter. It's like when you see uh, Mrs. Weasley like doing the dishes like mm-hmm. that. Like, that's kind of like that. You just like tell it what to do. Like you could tell, like you could, I mean, you could like imagine it doing the dishes and like, but you'd have to control it. So gotcha. you just have to use your brain instead of your hands, but mm-hmm. it would still do the dishes for you. <laughs> right. It requires a bit of multitasking on your part. Yes. But... This one's interesting because Mm -hmm. for me, initially I was thinking Hufflepuff because it's also sort of a quick, relatively harmless. I suppose, though, you could be using it for the sake of combat, right? Or is it? No, you can't use it for combat. Ah, I see. It's not a combat thing. Is it used like, you know, if you need to like get access to something that you can't necessarily like touch immediately? Okay. Yeah. Also, like um, another example in the game that I play, um, I used it to grab a cursed item Mm -hmm. so that I did not get cursed. (laughs) So now my rule is if you find something on the ground, you don't touch it. You just grab it with the mage hand first, Mm -hmm. just like you tell children, like, don't touch it. Oh, yeah. This is is like a this this would be revolutionary in child care. (laughs) In terms of like, you know, you see your kid acted up across the playground. You just tap him on the shoulder like, hey, stop it. (laughs) Yep. Yeah, just mage hand that all the all the like Brentwood moms having their like little gossip conversation. They're like, Connor, Connor. He's not listening, mage hand. Connor, come mage over here. Mage hand hands the apple slices. Yeah. Oh my god. I more imagine the mage hand just like picking up after their dog poop. Mm-hmm. Just instead of a baggie, it's just like just like picks it up in their its little mage hand and just like carries it to the trash can. And it's even more impressive in oh, what was the name of the realm that makes it skeletal? Oh, Ravenloft, yeah. Ravenloft mm-hmm. would be very fun. Like would it be picking up after skeletal dogs? I mean, probably. God, mm. so that place is messed up. I'm liking Ravenloft. <laughs> I love Ravenloft, but with well, it's traumatic. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, the the practicality function of it makes me think uh, Ravenclaw, though. So I'm mm-hmm. curious. I think so. I think so too because you could also the how I think of it if you're a, a Ravenclaw using it is you could also write two essays at once. You could write an essay and then you could also have your have your mage hand be writing like notes next to you. Mm. Like it would be great for school. Yeah. So from a practical standpoint, that mm-hmm. seems great. I don't want to write the one essay at a time. <laughs> I don't want to write the one essay. <laughs> All right. What do we have next All as right. far as cantrips go? All right. Why don't we do this one, which is a chill touch. Chill touch. This is a necromancy cantrip. Um. And this is a very similar to Mage Hand, but you create a ghostly skeletal hand, not to be confused with the skeletal hand that appears in Ravenloft. Right. Um, and you make a ranged spell, a cha- spell attack, which means like it goes pew. And the uh, 
and it's, it hits them with the chill of the grave. And on hit, the target Whoa. takes 1d8 necrotic damage. And that's like, necrotic damage is like serious damage. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's like, it's bad. It's like pretty much the worst damage you can get because if you die from necrotic damage, you don't get death saves, which are like, you roll a d20 three times. Mm-hmm. You just die. And gotcha. you die from necrotic damage. Ah, so yeah. this, oh, I didn't know there were different kinds of damage. Oh, God, yeah. There's so lots. we <laughs> stepped things up a lot from, yeah. hey, we can manifest smells. And, well, this hand could, like, move things to, we'll deal damage. Yeah, yeah this hand is going to murder serious. you. That potential, like, it's, it's one damage, but it's the worst kind of yeah, damage. Yeah, and, like, the, the, as the, uh, you die, you stay dead sort of thing is very yeah. very scary. The best part is that until the end of the spell, the hand clings to the target. So it's just like... <laughs> oh, no, I don't like this one. This so this spooky. isn't a Ravenclaw or a Hufflepuff. But I, I beg to say, even though it sounds scary, I think it might be a Gryffindor. Mm. Oh, what, why? Do you because think? if you hit an undead target... It has the advantage on attack rolls against you until the end of your next turn. So it seems like it's an evil spell, but in in some situations, in some situations, I feel it won't hurt. Un- I mean, it won't hurt undead. Mm-hmm. So there's really nothing it can do to like creepy, like creepy things. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah. And and Gryffindors do tend to have a throw everything, including the kitchen sink sort of mentality, which I feel yeah. like would almost put this spell sorry what was it called again oh chill touch chill yeah. touch um into that camp of like uh try chill touch and it does nothing but like <laughs> would it deflect off or it just like hits and is absorbed so if you hit something undead with this like mm-hmm. um an undead target it means that um it has Oh, sorry, it has disadvantage. I didn't mean, I meant to say disadvantage, not advantage. Mm-hmm. So which means that it actually, it causes the undead to not be able to hurt you. So it looks super scary, but it actually damages undead. Mm-hmm. Oh, which, gotcha. Yeah, so it so actually it, damages it. So it nullifies. It nullifies, yeah. It makes them so that they can't hit you. Oh, that's... that's Like, well, can't hit you as well, technically. Right. So that, to me, yeah, does make it lean more Gryffindor, I right. think. So it's scary, but it also can really hurt like the undead and like scary evil things. Mm -hmm. All right. I buy Gryffindor for that reason. Although you could make the argument that because it is so like it's it's the silver bullet for anything almost that it's very pinpointed and precise in its actions, which is something that Slytherins are very like zeroed in on this one particular thing. Mm. Mm. That is true. I don't know. It, it's probably very close to the line for me, mm-hmm. uh, calling it one way or the other. But although I will say, I uh, I would love to reappropriate chill touch into my like everyday vocabulary, <laughs> like just completely uh, out of context, because it just sounds like some like somebody who's like really good at like making people feel relaxed in any situation. They got a chill touch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you go over to their house, you immediately have a drink, and they're wearing sunglasses. Chill touch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what do we have next? Um, I th- should we move into first level spells or keep are these doing- also still cantrips? No, or- no, no, these are okay. Okay, staying- so first level spells. I don't. I don't mind shifting. All right. Um, so first level spells. This one, I'm just talking about some that I've had that I have a lot of experience with in my games, which mm-hmm. I've just seen seen do ridiculous things. Mm-hmm. So this is a first level spell that is an evocation spell, which means like wizards can use it. I don't believe sorcerers can. They might be able to. And bards can also use it. What is the distinction between a wizard and a sorcerer? So this is that's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So wizards learn magic through books and Mm -hmm. learning the arcane like by studying by going to wizard school by doing all that and spending time with with these with the spell scrolls and things like that so all the harry potter people are would fit into this definition too okay yes yeah uh sorcerers though are innate spell casters so they either have a bloodline that gives them the ability to cast spells think of more like they don't Like, unless they have an arcane knowledge, they don't necessarily know it's a fireball. They just shoot fireball out of their hands. Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Because in Harry Potter, some people can do magic, but they don't come from magic. Oh, wait. Are are there there anybody in Harry Potter who does who, like, only knows magic from learning and doesn't have, like, the the blood, like, magic essence to them? Like, they're not born with magic? I don't think so. Okay. Does that mean that everyone's actually a sorcerer then? I don't believe that 
Harry Potter is observing the, the <laughs> D&D rules as I'm far as defining. To I think they're both. Where we are. I think they're mm-hmm. both. Like, they innately have magic, but they also have to learn to use it properly. Right. Whereas, yeah. like, a sorcerer is just, like, like, the magic that they do, they've just always innately known how to do it. Yeah, so, like, my character in the D&D game I play is a sorcerer, but she's also... The an unearthed arcana sorcerer, mm-hmm. which means that she can also cast cleric spells. She can cl- cast divine spells because her sorcerer ability is innate from being like pretty much either somehow related or chosen to some divine like wh- where the powers of the gods come from. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's like a weird that's like a weird loophole. But other sorcerers say like they might have dragon blood they might be a dragon sort like they might have like fire from a dragon or a phoenix or Mm -hmm. like other creatures or like a bloodline that caused them to have their powers and then there's warlocks gotcha (laughs) warlocks go into a pact with an ancient uh god usually an old god think like cthulhu oh hell yeah so yeah warlocks get a whole different spell set and reads language (laughs) Warlocks oh, a whole different spell guy. set. Yeah, they they worship old gods. They go into pretty much a, a a pact with these old gods to get power. And these old gods gods aren't the aren't the same as the gods that, of the pantheon that we're talking about. Who are like they're pretty much just actual people who are just super powerful in D anD. d The gods are just like, hey, I'm a god, and it's like, okay, they like fight each other and stuff. Think the Greek gods. Mm-hmm. Now oh, the gotcha. old gods are the messed up ones. If you go into packs with them, then you get like messed up powers, like this one spell called um. And like everyone's black tentacles, you can get like crazy and like all these messed up spells and it's super cool. But like you also have to be in a pact with an old god. So I always have thought about like um, like how we make this distinction for old gods and new gods. And I'm like, are they are they saying like like even gods exist on an evolutionary spectrum where like the <laughs> ones that like started out are more animalistic and therefore like more base and then like the ones that come later have had time to evolve their humanity. Yeah. And I was like, that seems like a pretty weird prejudice distinction, but I think it's like maybe the, the ones that are human like came out of humans worshiping them as humans. Oh, gotcha. And then maybe the old gods just came from more of like a primordial, like, the original like existence of the universe sort of thing. So, so the human gods close of a connection. Exactly. So the human gods have power because humans worship them and the humans like put them in humans imbued like or or almost manifested these yeah. new gods. Yeah, because even I think even in D D, if if the gods lose followers and worshippers, they pretty much don't exist anymore. So yeah. isn't it I haven't read the book, so now I'm speaking a little out of turn, but I believe it's in uh, American gods, the whole concept is what you were saying. Yeah, of like, yeah, if you're yeah, not, yeah. and in American gods, everyone's worshiping like technology yeah. as opposed to this like larger pantheon of exactly. gods. Exactly. So, so they're just like bus drivers and shit. Yeah. yeah. I, I got halfway through that book and then I was like, this is cool. And then I forgot about it. I've heard it's, <laughs> I've heard it's very good. Yeah, I just it was fine. Haven't... Like, that was fine. That's the, that's the critique. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Fine. It was fine. It's uh, on the so back to of go the back, um, what did you say this this spell is again? Which one? Uh, under this distinction. Oh, uh, we were talking. Well, we started to talk about first level spells, yeah. and then I very quickly <laughs> asked the question: <laughs> What is the difference between wizards and sorcerers? Yeah, and so, yeah. we never got past that. I don't yeah. Really. So, um, getting back to first level spells, uh, what else do we need to know? Um, okay, so first level spells. That's. Cantrips are really what you're going to use to be creative at low levels. And then first level spells, you start to be able to do damage. Mm -hmm. And so and also like shield yourself and do a lot of things like that. So there's still a lot of creativity in first level spells because you are such a low level. You're not really needing to do it like you. You don't necessarily hopefully you won't need to be like fireballing people at first level. Otherwise, your DMs real mean. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) But um, but yeah, so the spell that I was going to talk about that's first level spell is called Thunder Wave. Now, this is a good... Sounds great. Sounds like a Pokemon yeah, move. exactly. And it's a good bard. Sp- our bard uses it all the time. Like, and it's... It's it's got a lot of dumb stuff. Like, so it's a wave of thunderous force that sweeps out from you. Each creature in a 15-foot cube orienting from you must make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save, a creature takes 2d8 thunder damage and is pushed 10 feet away from you. The other thing is that it creates... A thunderous boom audible out to 300 feet, which means that if you are on a stealth mission and uh, someone casts Thunder Wave, everybody knows you're in trouble. Yeah. How many times have we done that? 
a lot. <laughs> it's interesting yeah. that within that description, this is the second time now that they've used cubic yeah. as the sort of measurement. Well, as you know why? Mm-hmm. Because all the maps are cubic. Oh. All the D&D maps are all squares. Yeah, it's like a grid. I yeah, see. it's a grid. So when I you're... Was- Wondering what I was like, should it be radially? <laughs> that- like your Ravenclaw ass is like, oh, the the system of what we measure things by, and I'm and like that, like that stuff never matters to me because I can't like conceptualize either uh, system in my head. And and for Imperial the record, or metric. that was a spot on impression of me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did push up my glasses as I, I did saw it. it. It happened. Yeah. <laughs> It was transformative, almost. I, I hope I get my Academy Award playing you in the biopic. Mm-hmm. You will. Uh, so, yeah. So, Thunder Wave basically, like, is just, like, you know, it. so is it, it just the thunder sort of thing? It's not, like, uh, for the Constitution check, what is that doing? Is that, like, is that, like, uh, like, if you, like faint from something yes yeah so your constitution has to do with your pretty much your physical stamina so a constitution check like to see if you fall over just be like how strong you are to withstand this it's not a strength check it's like a withstanding check Mm -hmm. can you withstand this force if you can't you get knocked 10 feet and you also take damage gotcha so in either case you're going to take damage but Constitution determines whether or right. not you're if you also fail, getting launched. Well, if you fail, you take the full brunt of the damage. If you succeed, you only take half. Oh, okay. And it's... And you don't get knocked back. And despite the fact, and this is me just being needlessly critical of this, so it is sonic damage, not... Yes. Not lightning damage. Because no, it it's is. not lightning. It would just be force. It's actually force damage. Force like, damage. It's almost like a sonic boom. Because if there was Thunder some Wave. electric component to that, I would have been very... T- lightning and thunder are different. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to say like this is probably not Hufflepuff at the very least. No, no, no. I don't like, think I don't, so I don't feel like a Hufflepuff would feel super comfortable casting a spell that could... Uh, like uh, potentially hurt his comrades. I think this no. is a Gryffindor. It's yeah, pure destruction. Yeah, yeah. And Gryffindors like sometimes will, like you said, just throw caution to the wind with what they're doing and not really think about the consequences before they do it. So I agree one hundred percent. Also, since I I believe we've now moved past cantrips, I do think just sorting cantrips holistically, based on the what you stressed at the very start holly of there's a creative nature yeah. behind them and hufflepuffs are creative as all get out oh yeah no i'm imagining if i'm a like a wizard or a sorcerer or whatever like these are the only kind of spells i'll probably ever do because i'll just feel really bad if i like accidentally really damage somebody <laughs> yeah yeah they're def- i think they're definitely hufflepuff because they are very creative and other ones that we didn't talk about were like Things like mending, where you can fix someone's clothes, and like message, where you can send a little message, or like minor illusion, or just like little things where you can help people. Yeah, and- those all seem very puffy. But all mm-hmm. right, moving past Thunder Wave, another first level spell. All right, um, so this one is another, I feel like another helpful spell, but it's called a Silent Image. Mm-hmm. And so it's pretty much just a good way to hide. <laughs> It's like you just create. Hold on, let me see how big the the radius is. I like hiding during combat. Go on. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh... <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna admit it. There are some people when you're doing these sort of things that they are very much on uh, the offense, and then there are people like me who immediately panic and are like, "Okay, what can I do to like survive for as long as possible and maybe be helpful." Uh, but I will say I do show I, if I if I am honest with myself, I show a bit of cowardice on the field, fellas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a benefit to all of that, especially if you can be like, I'm hiding, I'm hiding, I'm hiding. And I do one thing near the end to prove my worth or yeah, like, while I, the fight I usually is going trip on. on my own dick. This is why I usually uh, give myself like healer sort of things. So I'm like, I'm going to get overwhelmed if I have to actually go and start swinging swords. <laughs> But so like, yeah, you'd, you'd be the one who you're like, the battle's broken out. I'm going to make a chase for the chalice that is like the thing that incited like, this. Wait, we're not going after the chalice right now. I'm like, oh, get that chalice. Yeah. I'm yeah. still helping. Mm-hmm. I run away a lot. So I understand that. 
But this one is useful for that because uh, you can create the image of an object, a creature, or some other visual visual phenomenon that is no larger than a 15 foot cube. The image appears a at a spot within you could within a range and lasts for the duration. The image is purely visual. So you can like alter it to make it look like it's walking. Like you can, if you create an image of a creature and move it, like you can imagine like stop motion. <laughs> oh, so it's not going to be true to life in anim- like animated. Kind of, yeah. But so like this what is I like use it for early prototype Tupac yes, performance yes, at Coachella. Yes, and what what I use it for is like imagine that you're hiding from someone. You can just make it look like the wall that you're against, mm. and just like put it in front of you. Oh, and then fabulous! You're just, like gone. <laughs> So it's it's more helpful, at least as you've used it in a stealth yes, practicality yeah, standpoint. Yeah, for sure. Or like just hiding in something. Like maybe it's a, a you make like a, a, a crate. It looks like a crate, but you're actually inside of it. Like, please don't hurt me. Which, which house do you think is most likely to hide in a crate? Because I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty confident that it's the one that I belong to. But at the same time, I'm thinking that at least... Like strategically speaking, that might be a Ravenclaw like stratagem move of just like we're gonna create a wall and we're all gonna walk behind this wall <laughs> and just like make our way away from a battle or whatever. Yeah, it's de- I mean it's definitely not a Slytherin. It's it's unlikely that it's a Gryffindor. Yeah, well it's passive. Yes. Uh, so you just have to decide if you think Ravenclaws would be passive in their. Uh, in like in like trying to stealth away from something, or if they would be more uh, proactive. I think that's situational. Truth be told, yeah, they would just they'd make like the value judgment. Mm-hmm. They, um, they'd have to go like, all right, weighing our pros, you know, like what's the? F- it, it's going to be the thing that the Ravenclaw is going to get in their own head as yeah. to. Well, then practically, like you said, um, you said you mostly use it just to to hide from yeah. things. Um. Or distract things. Like, mm-hmm. I think once I used it to, like, make a giant's, like, wife appear in, like, a doorway or mm-hmm. something and be like, they're up there. <laughs> <laughs> so you just make it look like someone's, like, there, but they're not. It's definitely, like, a distraction thing. Okay. Well, then, you know, uh, like, yeah, just, like, taking into account that you would be using it strategically. Which, truth be told, like, in that situation, that's a pretty crafty move, which yeah. would make me almost be, like, Slytherin, but it's... I don't know, because I feel like Slytherins would be more likely to put something actually vulnerable in a position, like something actually expendable instead of mm. like just a phantom I image. Uh, I I think I think it's a Ravenclaw. I think it's like it's like used to be like, OK, will this be worth us actually putting effort into something? No, then let's throw a distraction at it and move on or let's let it play out to see what happens. I'll take it. What are, what are we feeling next as far as first level spells go? So classic first level spell, magic missile. Okay. It's just a a missile that you shoot. You create three glowing darts of magical force. Each dart hits a creature of your choice that you can see within range. A dart deals 1d4 plus 1 force damage to its target. Now, the thing about the darts and magic missile as a spell itself, why it makes it super useful, you do not have to roll to hit. It hits automatically every time. Gotcha. So it's always dealing three damage. But you can also cast it as a higher level spell. So, um... This uh, each sp- using a spell slot of second level or higher, the spell creates one more dart for each slot above first. Oh, so wow. you can get more and more and more darts. How Whoa. high is there? Is there a, a level cap? In uh, D&D? Ninth level spells is where uh, they stop. Gotcha. So you can go up to you could cast it as a ninth level spell. And I, I believe that you get nine one D four plus one missiles. That's pretty so, solid. Or eight, actually, because that spell slot of second. So but yeah, it's a lot. That's a solid barrage of damage yeah. that is guaranteed. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, that seems. I hmm, that's interesting. It's not a Hufflepuff. I'm going to say it's Gryffindor. OK. Yeah, because it's like it's direct. Um, It's aggressive, Uh, but it's not necessarily like sneaky or it's just very like open brunt. Like, let's do this. Mm hmm. Yeah. There's the part of me that Slytherin could be in the cards just in the fact that it's, I I suppose your directness, like we're both viewing directness in a slightly different way. 
Oh well, yeah, because like I said, it's all it all depends on like uh I feel like uh I'll give Slytherins you the Gryffindor. You, I'll give you the Gryffindor. Well, because just I think Slytherins are a little bit more self-preserving and they'd be like, is this the right time? Whereas mm-hmm. like a, a Gryffindor would be like, let's just do this and see what happens. And so I feel like magic missiles maybe would lend themselves a little bit better to that sort of fighting strategy. I suppose strategy. so. I mm-hmm. suppose so. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's very direct. There's no there's no wishy-washiness to magic missile. It's just damage. Right. Uh, so then we're moving on to second level spells. I think I think it might be harder for us to actually sort first level spells like holistically right just based on we're starting to branch out but cantrips felt like overall we could go hufflepuff yeah so moving moving forward we're not going to be okay. sorting the larger yeah, yeah. just spells umbrella. specifically yeah. um oh so just for people who don't necessarily play tabletop games uh but like about how long like into a campaign usually would it take to get to like the second level spells and stuff if you were if you were like moving through it depends really on on who's dming um i usually start my players out at like level three which i believe then they have second level spells just because it's more fun to have more to play with mm-hmm. but it's pretty the it's just like any it's just like considering like D was the beginning of video game leveling systems like that's where it came from right. is Early levels move very fast. You mm-hmm. level up very quickly. Right. And so now, like, my character in my game is level nine. And so we're we've, we're leveling up a lot slower because we're really powerful. Right. So the first few levels, like, probably up to, like, six or seven go super fast. And then you start slowing down. So it doesn't take too long. Probably just, like, like a couple sessions, four or five sessions to get to actually start getting some more powerful spells. Oh, gotcha. So what are we looking at now? Um, so this is a second level spell, which I love. It's called alter self. And so what happens is you assume a different form. Uh, when you cast a spell, you can choose one of the following options, which is aquatic adaption. You adapt your body to an aquatic environment, sprouting gills and growing webbing between Whoa, your fingers. Body horror. <laughs> and you can breathe Cronenberg underwater. Shit. Um, you can change your appearance to change into any person or whatever, as long as it is a humanoid form, doesn't matter if it's a different race, like an orc or whatever, mm-hmm. you can change into this person. Your voice changes, everything changes. You can become this person. Oh, it's like, it's like if I go on testosterone, <laughs> I'm going to sprout gills. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That is the gills, exact yes. one-to-one mm-hmm. of okay, what will so happen. I read like, that article. Is <laughs> this like werewolving where like it might hurt? Like you're like, is it literally your skin splitting open to like create these new? breathing apparatuses yes like you just get like it's like in harry potter when they like eat the gillyweed yeah they, and they dr- get gills have gillyweed or they uh drink polyjuice potion yeah it's exactly but it's all in one spell and the last thing is you can also grow natural weapons so you grow claws fangs spines horns or a different natural weapon of your choice and then you get an unarmed strike which deals 1d6 bludgeoning piercing or slashing damage damage and the the weapon is magic and you have a plus one bonus to the attack damage rolls you make using it and this is only self transformation correct yes it's only altering yourself so you can either use it for subterfuge by turning into someone else mm-hmm. or use it for damage by growing claws or use it to breathe underwater you can straight up like wolverine could yes you, you, could, you could you could just be like i'm wolverine this is my dnd character wolverine oh! he's got claws <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, oh that reminds me <laughs> i saw somebody on twitter the other day say they started a campaign and they convinced their fellow travelers on the campaign to let them play a minion oh god <laughs> I, okay like like i allow people to be whatever they want like for example when chris was playing in my game chris wanted to be a gorilla and i was like okay chris well you're a gorilla who is you're a druid who's stuck in the form of a gorilla Mm-hmm. That's that's my compromise. Did he wanted did he originally pitch as I'm an actual gorilla? Yes. And I'm like, okay, well, I mean, it's, well, you can compromise. Right. Minion, there's no compromise to a minion. There's no compromise there. <laughs> there's no like anything that you can actually compromise. Like, I just imagine the entire time they were speaking in gibberish. I, just, every time. I draw the line. I draw the line at minion. You draw the line at yeah, minion. I think I, I think most of the internet draws yeah, a line yeah, at minion. Yeah. No, that's Unless like that's like, the hill that people die on is hating fucking. <laughs> minions <laughs> unless they're people on facebook who just continue to post minion memes and think it's relevant it's you oh, know yeah. there's that unironic ironic everyone should love. say hi to their yeah. aunt by the way <laughs> <laughs> with a minion meme oh man so okay I, I, there's the part of me that as far as this what was the name of the spell this uh alter self alter self which is 
very straightforward. Sounds Alter Self sounds like a like a 1980s era sci-fi <laughs> anthology, <laughs> like a Harlan yeah. Ellison, like the Alter Self. Oh yeah, and it's definitely a the Alter Self. Like mm-hmm. that's that's a type. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the alter self are coming. And then one person's like, I thought I was a normal boy, but then puberty hit and I'm the alter self. It looks like we have found the alter self. We must destroy him. Oh, guys, you gotta help me. Um, I'm thinking alter self might be Slytherin. Yeah, dude, it's sneaky as hell. Well, it's pretty sneaky. It's got a great amount of versatility to it as well. Yeah. So you can be as... Like, I mean, it's it's got a conniving nature to it, but um, always beneficial. Like, it's it's very it's it's clever, it's yeah. crafty, it's good. That's why it's one of my favorite spells because not only can you have water breathing, which that's gonna save your ass at some point, right? <laughs> like, you can also have natural weapons, which like if you lose everything, all your weapon, like everything, you can just grow claws and just start ripping at them. So Hell you yeah. could. Alter self yourself into a bird. No, you can't. That's polymorph. That's different. Oh, okay. You can't. You can only be a humanoid. So it's you. If you change into something, all you can do is grow gills, claws, or become a different humanoid. So literally, the main purpose is to is to be sneaky, to be could turning I be into someone else. Could I myself grow a bigger butt? Yes, you, you could do that. All right, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> what are what? What's next? <laughs> it's good. It's good. Oh yeah, this one is really dumb. Okay. <laughs> Excited. All right. And and a lot of them that I'm picking aren't just like straight up damage spells because there are a lot of spells where are just like, mm-hmm. like fire, I hurt you. Like, and that's pretty obviously what we're going to pick. So I'm oh, picking sure. a little bit more lesser known, more subtle spells. Yeah, get some mm-hmm. deep cuts, girl. Yeah. So this spell is called called uh, Enlarge Reduce. So Enlarge <laughs> Reduce. Uh, that, that, that's going to help you with your butt there. Reed. Yes. Yeah. Enlarge. So you choose a target. Um. You cause a creature or any object you see within rage to grow larger or smaller for the duration. Choose either a creature or an object that is neither worn nor carried. If the target is unwilling, you can make a constitution saving throw. On a success, the spell has no effect. If the target is a creature, everything it is wearing and carrying sizes with it. Any item dropped by an affected creature returns to normal size once. So pretty much you can make anything big or small. So you can take a person and make them tiny Mm -hmm. and they don't become like really tiny. They just become like half their size, (laughs) (laughs) which means like if they're attacking you, they're just like, "Eh." and then like now they're attacking you tiny. So you basically can double or half. Yes, exactly. What's an example of a benefit of enlarging something? Probably reaching something as opposed to maybe as opposed to using um, like mage hand for whatever reason. Also you get bonuses. So if you, if you make something larger, you get advantage on strength tech checks and strength Mm. saving throws, which means instead of rolling one D 20, you can roll two D twenties and you take the higher of the two. Oh, okay. So it actually gives you a benefit of becoming stronger. And if you become smaller, the same thing sort of happens. And, uh, uh, the target's weapons shrink and the target's attacks with them deal 1d4 less damage because they're tiny. So in a, one of the battles I did in my game, I shrank this this like asshole vampire guy and I made him really tiny. Mm-hmm. And then like we crushed him with like some rocks or something. I don't remember. But like he was tiny, so he couldn't hurt anyone because all his weapons were tiny. So I was like, right. what are you going to do? I'm just going to like poke <laughs> me. Like, this one, I'm strangely split between... Hufflepuff and Slytherin. Oh, what uh, What are your reasons for choosing either of those? It's like Hufflepuff more on the cutesy factor in like reduction on, on the halvesing. Uh, although I suppose from a Ravenclaw perspective, that's also solid strategy. Uh, Slytherin because you're just like straight up turning the tables. Like it's yeah. a it's a quick like divisive. You're just saying like, Nope, or <laughs> like, great, uh, but we're all giants, like, in this moment, so we're gonna, and you theoretically could uh, half one character and grow others in the same, like. I think it, I think it's um only one at a time. Oh, yeah. okay. But if theoretically you were a band of warlocks who all knew this spell is that possible yes yeah uh also it's just like a pretty like shitty thing to do i feel like it's kind of slithery mm-hmm. because it's just like 
yeah, you're just like half your size. Like you're not even really tiny. You're just like half. So it's just frustrating. And like, it's definitely like not giving people like a fair fight. No, oh, no, it's it's shifting the tide. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say like this is this is more in the gray area of ethics and magic, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, so I'd probably put it in Slytherin. OK, you you gave like me a that. very decisive, like <laughs> hard look. And it's also worth noting earlier when Reed said enlarge after my comment about, oh, this is a spell that you can use to enlarge your butt. We both locked eyes <laughs> for a moment and then quietly leaned <laughs> off mic and silently laughed. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you can choose specific body parts, but, you know, that's up to your DM. Yeah, I'm like, going to say most of them just I, say I yes mad. for the humor factor. I, right. I would get mad and just, like, shrink shrink people's junk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or me, I get, no, I think maybe enlarging somebody's junk. Like a like a comic amount would be worse to do to them. Well, you enlarge their junk and then you kick them, <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes easier to kick. I would enlarge my foot too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can only enlarge one at a time. That's uh, true. Shoot. Yeah, so you got to choose. It's a tough. It's a tough call. <laughs> what else we got going on in spells? Um, so I'm gonna move to third level spells. Hell yeah! To go for one of my favorite all time spells forever, which is fireball. Straightforward. Yeah. I think uh, I can gather what happens here. Yeah, yes. I heard, it was like a very popular whiskey the last couple of years. Fireball. <laughs> is that what you're talking about? <laughs> it is. I got to get that for my next D&D game. It's themed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was that that video of everybody taking shots of fireball at that wedding. And we all were like, ha ha ha. What a delight. Let's make that viral. Drunk people. It, no, it got it had like a hot minute of being like a thing. I missed that. I uh, never saw that. Pitbull, the, 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 the illustrious singer, uh, Dale, uh, re- like released a single that was called Fireball, and I'm pretty sure was like written f- to promote the the that whiskey. That is hilarious. Yeah, and that's your Fireball t- whiskey trivia for today. This episode sponsored by Fireball whiskey. <laughs> yep. Go to FireballWhiskey.com. Put in the promo code uh, so- Magic Spells uh, for twenty percent off your whiskey uh, needs. Yep, that's right. Throwing Fireball whiskey, we're definitely sponsored. <laughs> so Fireball, it's a damage spell. Yes. What's its cubic range? 20 feet. Oh, damn. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, it is a no nonsense. And remember how before I was talking about like 1d6, like really small amounts of damage. This spell does 8d6 damage just in oh, its shit. base level. 8d6. Wow. And then if you, above third level, you mm-hmm. can... Create it by one, add one more D6. So it means if you're third level, so you have nine more levels. So mm-hmm. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can add six more D6 to this. So eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, eight, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, for 14. Uh, at ninth level, you could cast this at 14 D6 damage. That's terrifying. Then, and, and this is a singular fireball yes. that is hurtling towards. Yes, it will hurt everyone in the in radius. That radius. Yes. And yeah, if, yeah, because it's not like a, it's like not a controlled directed thing. You it's can like, do that though. Whoa. That, so if you're a sorcerer, you can do a thing called careful spell, which allows you to actually mold your fire around your team. Oh. And so that you don't catch them on fire, which is what I always do. I use careful spell, mold the fire around them, and it blows everyone else up, but not your friends. Gotcha. That's great. Yeah. Only sorcerers can do that, though. Wizards can't. Wizards That's can only cast That's some emotional fireball. labor right there, that you're taking that extra step to be that's like, true. listen, I'm not yeah, going to let anybody get burned up. You're working the blood up. to your benefit on mm-hmm. this one. Yeah, that's, that's So, fair. okay, sorry. So there's careful spell, yes. which I feel like is a sorcerer thing is a sorcerer yes. thing, which I feel we might as well sort. And what level is that? Does that careful spell? I believe you get your sorcerer's abilities at like two or three. I'm not sure. sure. But it's something like that. Uh, careful spell seems straight up Hufflepuff. Oh, yeah. Because That's that's like, let's reduce. Let's all be great. Let's let's be safe. Let's yeah. be fucking careful. The and crazy thing, though, is you can also do an enhanced spell as a sorcerer. So you can be careful, but you can also do more damage. Mm. But I choose careful because it's like this already does like a shitload of damage. Like, yeah, right, 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 right. You don't need to do more right now. Like yeah. you're okay. I don't and, fuck with fire uh, in non magical settings. Well, and based based off of what you provided, which was information that I wasn't even thinking of. Which oh yeah, the blast damage hits in all directions, so it could hurt your team. This seems like a Gryffindor of a spell, right? Because yeah, 
that blast damage. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is that its range is 150 feet, which means you can cast it from 150 feet away. Mm-hmm. So you can be super far away and then just fireball. Yeah. That. I don't know. Like, I how how are, like, large regions of this universe not always on fire? I mean, they are. <laughs> Probably <laughs> constantly. Oh, God. Imagine being a firefighter in the Dungeons & Dragons world. <laughs> I don't think they have those. Huh? No? I think they're dead. <laughs> I think they're just dead. <laughs> because they wind up encountering some, like, oh, these aren't fires. These are actually fire beings. Yep. 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 And now mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been engulfed by them. Yep. Well, I mean, that would be part of your training. It's like to learn to tell the difference if you're part of the fire brigade. Yeah. In this universe. That's a rough road. Yes. And like any, anyone who's in, in like inspired to do that, everyone's like, you you could just be like a cleric or. or uh, a, I have a calling to put out fires. So. Or an yeah. innkeeper. No, the innkeepers always get killed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's I know. the most dangerous job ever. <laughs> yeah. Meetings are going to happen there and things are going to go yeah, south every real time. fast. Mm-hmm. All right, so fireball, very clearly a Gryffindor. Mm-hmm. Uh, There's what? ways to make it Hufflepuff, but well, there are also, I suppose, like you could make the argument if you're sniping from a soup, the 150 feet away. That's kind of a Slytherin yeah, move. Yeah, yeah. But depends on how you play, really. Right. There is some versatility and shifting tide with all of this. But what right. is our next? Spell? Are we going to keep doing? Um, I believe we're in third level. We can do whatever, man. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do. Let's you do assume fun... we've got a structure to any of this. Look, <laughs> let's do something more interesting in fourth level because okay. fourth level is really when you start. Like third level is when you really start getting a lot of damage. Fourth level is when you start doing weird stuff. I guess like <laughs> this one. This one is a protection spell called Stone Skin. Great. And stone skin, it lasts for up to an hour and turns the flesh of a willing creature you touch as hard as stone. And until the start, the spell ends, the target has resistance, which means like, I, I think resistance is that you actually always take half damage. I can't remember. Whatever. Oh, that's incredible. Someone look it up. I don't know. I can't. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I can't remember. Um, uh, you get resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, which means nothing can really hurt you unless it's a magical weapon. Right. But you also just look like a rock person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does so this, this hurt? Would, would, would this hurt somebody to like have their skin turn into stone? I'm always like, like, like transformational things. I'm always like so curious about like how much you like actually have to like feel the the transition. It probably feel gross. Yeah. Like I mean, it probably feel like you just got like. A bun- you know, oh, I know what it feels like. You know when you get super glue on your hand? Oh, I like bet it feels more, like that. A more I love version. that. Oh, no. You just keep turning yourself into stone. You're just like, no, I sorry. like it. Sorry, <laughs> not super glue. Uh, just like regular Elmer's glue. No, I like the no, Elmer's no. glue. No. Super glue, like I don't super glue is a glob gross. Of, a glob of super glue, and it like fuses around your yeah. skin, and like you can't, and you, you just feel encased. Yeah, I feel like that's what it would feel like. Uh, yeah, that would be pretty unpleasant. At the same time, I'm just wait, as soon as you said stone skin, I immediately went into Game of Thrones with gray, <laughs> oh, yeah, grayscale. Yeah. Uh, Jorah which, the Explorer. Which is like they never they haven't still really explained the full extent of no. what it does outside of I guess you lose your mind at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I, I won't get into any spoilers, but I'm very glad I finally am up to speed on Game of Thrones. So yeah. I'm a little good. risk free. As far as Sundays go. As long as there's dragons, I'm just like, I'm good to go. There are <laughs> dragons. Yeah. Uh, okay, so stone skin seems Hufflepuffy as its preventative, but it also might be... I mean, it's really for battle. It's only for going into battle. Mm. So really, you would already have to be in battle to be like, I need this. Gotcha. So... So that's more of a tactical move. It is, yeah. Like, you would have to be like, all right, I know I'm going to get stabbed today, so I got to turn myself into a rock. (laughs) Gryffindor. Yeah, I guess so. I'm just thinking if you're saying, I am going to be hurting myself. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, which means that you're, like, brave enough to be out on the front lines to begin with. mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, then I agree with that. And you're looking to barrel through things. Mm-hmm. This would definitely be a situation 
I feel, and I'm just thinking movie trailers right now, I'm imagining like a person running towards someone and they're like, that's crazy. And then they stone skin like as they're running and everyone's like, hot damn. And then they crash through whatever it is. And they're like, and you're like, oh my God, I didn't know you could do that. Like that's the dope moment that hits on um, the trailer. I'm thinking another version, another example of stone skin and popular culture is thing from Fantastic Four. Yeah. Like he yeah. basically just had like a permanent stone skin because like he can't like he he can take damage like no one's business. Yeah, but he's also like super unhappy all the time. Yeah, because that would suck to not be able to unstone skin yourself. Yeah, yeah, be pretty unpleasant. He he definitely got the shortest end of that stick. Oh, for sure. Because it's like this guy can stretch. She can turn invisible. He can catch on fire. This guy's a rock. You're and gross. Like, all the time. Yeah, and all like, the other ones can kind of conceal that thing. Yeah, everybody but he's else. just like, that's me a whole time? Do what? you remember him calling his wife in the first <laughs> movie? The one where he's just like a rock calling his wife from a payphone outside? These are moments where... Do you where remember that? I, I haven't God. seen it, but I just imagine him not being able to fit it was, inside it was the booth. Like, it was like too real. It was just like, oh, Jesus. Somebody like pitched that and was like, Man, <laughs> this conversation's going to be awkward as all hell. Let's roll on that. Let's roll on this for a little too long. Yeah. Let's put the guy in the suit in a trench coat and like a Dick Tracy hat and have him call his wife from a payphone outside and then try to see her. And then she just like, yeah, he does him. have a Dick Tracy yeah, thing going yeah, on. Yeah. I totally forgot about that. Also completely unrelated while <laughs> yeah. we're on that note, man, the Dick Tracy movie, they cast Madonna as the main, like, <laughs> like what was, what was up with that? Madonna keeps insisting that she acts. Yeah. But like, and I, I say that as someone who stands Madonna real hard. <laughs> But that's where you you casually like skirt out of out of the line. I'm, and, yeah. I'm gonna still watch it and love it, but I can understand why it would not be for other people. Her acting it is a pretty cheesy film if yeah. you've not seen Dick Tracy because they I went feel like, like I saw it a long they went time ago. Full comic book, and they even I believe it's like a yellow or red wrench because like <laughs> in the comic books, like that's right that weird color palette that they had. They're like. That's what we're going with <laughs> all the time. Everything's going to have that primary color vibe to it, but it's a weird, weird set of production design choices. Fun, but it it strikes you as like, oh, okay, that's it dates it. Yeah, there's a lot of money out there that is spent on bad decisions, and sometimes it keeps me up at night. <laughs> uh, what do we have next? Uh, the military. What? <laughs> So this is a fourth level spell. Great. It's called Phantasmal Killer. Uh, that sounds like a delight. That sounds like a Talking Heads album. It does. Yeah. Um, so what happens is 120 feet range. You tap into the nightmares of a creature you can see within range <laughs> oh, and sure. create an illusory manifestation of its deepest fears visible only to that creature. The target must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the target becomes frightened for the duration. I have no I, idea where we would put this. This is a Slytherin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the end of each of the target's turn, target's turns before the spell ends, the target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or take 4d10 psychic damage, which is no joke. So you're also taking brain damage from this spell. What's, what is the baseline stat for like psychic uh, like health? Oh, well, it would just be based on your hit points. Oh, I see. Yeah, so I your see. hit points would go down 40, 10. But 40, 10 is a lot. If you roll four tens, you're taking 40 damage. And it like if you're like a caster and you're like level three, four, five, like that could be all your hit points. You gotcha. could just be dead. So that could be game over courtesy of nightmare fuel. Right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. And that, so it... <laughs> In this situation, and now this is speaking to you more specifically as like a DM and player. Right. uh, And less just as like our overlord of knowledge right now. In the situation where someone says that they're casting Phantasmic Kill. That's the correct name, right? Phantasmal Killer. Phantasmal Killer. (laughs) Sorry. Um, So they cast Phantasmal Killer. Is that a situation where they need to determine what it is that this enemy or character's fear is? So everybody gets like more than likely a laugh because we're going to go with something goofy like, yeah, they're afraid of minions. Right. <laughs> like if I were the DM, I would definitely encourage people to share what they see mm-hmm. because it would just make it more 
interesting and personal in the fight. Yeah. So like if mm-hmm. you're the character being affected by a fat phantasmal killer, like, you know, I would say like, okay, so what, what are you seeing? And, mm-hmm. and also it would give like a role play option to see like, how do you react? Mm-hmm. So like, if it's say like, like let's say for Harry Potter example, Lupin was afraid of the moon. If it's the moon, they're like, Oh, like right. cowering from the moon. So the boat, the Bogart in the closet. Sort yes, of situation. Yeah, exactly. I love that. That's like the equivalent of, of good horror movies that don't show you everything. Yeah. And then instead like make you decide what in your mind, what would be the most horrific thing. And I think that's always such a better and more effective tool. And yeah. like scaring somebody is actually making them tap into like internal uh, things like stuff that they might necessarily even tell other people that they're scared of. Yeah. That and and character development too. Like even if you're hit with this spell, like you have to think about what your character is afraid of. And mm-hmm. that's like a huge character thing. Like maybe it'll affect your character in a different way. And then later on your party has to figure out, Oh, why were they like cowering from this thing in the sky? Like it's a whole, like, right. It's a whole fun. It adds a lot of depth to your game. If, if some or you, as a DM, you could have an enemy cast this and then, Right. They have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> And especially if you had an entire like legion of these sort of spellcasters attacking your characters and then everyone like walks out of that being like, man, like we made it. <laughs> yeah. But like, Jesus Christ, right. yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, like, that's pretty much the definition of D&D right there. <laughs> everybody goes into group counseling after that. Yep. No, I, I, bad things just keep happening. That's how it works. I, lo- I love this sort of stuff. And I think that's why I tend to be more of a Call of Cthulhu type player, because I love like how much more that is like, like saturating every part. And especially like if you've never played the game before, you also have uh in addition to like other um stats you'll also have like sanity yeah and you'll lose it over time and that'll actually affect the way that you're able to play so you will love this and i'm just gonna tell the story because it's cool so yeah. the game that i play um my dm's the one of the writers for D, so he writes the books that's oh, incredible man. he's amazing and our game is like the best game ever like he's the best dm I've ever had also because he writes the books but also because he's been dming for like 25 years and so ravenloft where we started all kinds of messed up, like crazy, like messed up. It's a horror setting. So oh, it gotcha. is like it is like more like a horror setting. It's like a like a romantic vampire horror setting, but with all kinds of other messed up stuff. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that happened is there's we were stuck in this thing called the Amber Temple, which was this like messed up like temple place. And uh, to get out, we needed to accept a dark gift from these things called the the dark powers of Ravenloft. They're pretty much oh, another God. old God. And so if you accept this gift, you roll on a madness table, a permanent madness table. And whatever you get is what you have to role play. And so oh man, it's super cool. And like some of them are just like, I just love killing. And like, thankfully, <laughs> we didn't get that. <laughs> oh, but my, my friend goodness. rolled to resurrect my character and it was super funny because one of our party members an NPC had a scroll of resurrection re- resurrection so we just did it for no reason and it was hilarious and this was Jared <laughs> by the way it was hilarious Great. he was super upset Jared was previously on uh, the podcast oh good yeah. yeah okay so I play with Jared um, Anna Prosser and Nate Nate wants to battle gotcha and so that's our that's our party I'm and Nate's the bard of, those of course <laughs> yeah that makes sense of course he's the one who casts thunder wave all the time gotcha yeah so <laughs> and Jared's just abused constantly in our game and it's hilarious and sad. It, he plays into that yeah. very well. It's it's amazing. I'm but sure. so his character rolled on the madness table. And so he got madness of pretty much like taking on the traits of another character. And so oh. he took on the traits of my character who was just a panicky crazy person. So it was <laughs> it was great. But that that setting has so many good like options for creepy weird stuff to happen that it's just, I love it. I love it when anything creepy and weird happens in, yeah. in, in games. Yeah, I, I, I if I so much as see a, then you a, a just weird run, shadow. Huff out of there. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, there's there's some fast runs happening. Fast runs, yeah. But it's so funny because I think a lot of people see D and D is just like I'm just gonna go slay a dragon. Here I mm-hmm. go. But there's like so many settings and that mm-hmm. have so many weird, cool it, storytelling yeah. elements that I just it's gonna I be dependent on the people you're playing with. Oh, that's for like, sure. That's the thing that people like don't really like realize that it's not straight up like a board game. With just like a set of rules and expectations, there's a lot like in terms of like creativity and like acting ability, even that will determine how much fun you're having. And I think that's right. why people love. Uh, oh, what I, I want to ask you: What do you think about like the resurgence in popularity uh, among uh, people now? Like in in Dungeons and Dragons, or like there's a ton more like 
like a uh, live streaming and like uh, Harmon Quest and yeah, and podcasting. And then like I just know more of my normie friends, like my non dork friends, saying, "Yeah, I'm trying out Dungeons and Dragons." Uh, is that is that weird for you? It is weird. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I'm not gonna say it's like normal because it's definitely not normal. Because when I was in high school, we tried to start a D and D club, and our principal asked us if we would be using real blood. Hell yeah. So, like, I had, like, people, like, in my hometown that were full on, like, satanic panic about D&D. And, like, to have it, I mean, to have it be popular is amazing. Like, I'm, I hope that people can have, like, if someone can have the experience that, like, I have with my game right now and, like, how awesome and, like, you know, creativity driving it is, that's amazing. Like, I, I hope that everyone can experience that. So, it's, it's great. And, like, if they can also you know, be introduced to this and have some way to hang out with their friends. Like, Hey, cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's it a, is weird. It is weird. <laughs> like, it is a little weird. It's, it's a strange, like new social gaming experience for a lot of people. Yeah. I feel, um, who also like probably don't recognize what a huge commitment. Oh that yeah. D and D is. Yeah. Like you think you're going to be like, Oh, I'll go over for a couple of hours. We'll do a little dungeon things no realize if you start playing it's a long ass haul if you're gonna do it right yeah, yeah. I mean, for a friend's birthday we did like a single short campaign and it was still i i want to say we were there for like six to eight yeah. hours or something like that yeah and, i mean we and we went like super bare bones we're like nobody's leveling like it's just <laughs> like Here's your stats. Like you aren't picked. Like we're just going forward. Right. Like you yeah. can f- figure out like a little backstory for all your characters. Even but other simplified than that, version like that. If you're not ready to commit like three to four hours minimum, like yeah. you're not going to get much done. Right. Because usually it's going to take an hour to like get into a bar, order a drink, and somehow mm-hmm. get the information you're supposed to get for your mission. When I was, that'll take a long time. When I was in film school at UCLA, uh, one of my friends was like, "We should do this as a thing," and we were, we all were like, "Yeah!" And then we spent four hours just <laughs> coming up with our characters. Yeah, uh-huh. that's why. Like the good thing about this whole resurgence is like also. I feel like people they're more expectant of that, but also like I always, I print out character sheet, like pre-made one for people. Mm -hmm. Like if they're new, I'm just like, for example, like when Chris came and played with us, I just like printed him out a druid sheet. I was like, here you go. And he was like, but a gorilla. Yeah. And I was like, whatever, but here's your sheet. Like just roll this. Like it's, it's, I can simplify it a lot and it's fine. Like I've written, I did a charity um, campaign that I had to make two hours long. Like I had to, that was how much time I had to, oh boy. cause they paid to like have me DM for them. So like mm-hmm. I had to make sure, okay, they have two hours. I had to do it. And it was like, it was challenging, but I found that I could do it. Mm-hmm. So I feel like more and more adventures are going to come out that are shorter for newer players, which is, mm-hmm. which is good just to like hook them in and be like, do you want more? Yes or no. Right. right, right. <laughs> um, shall we tackle a few more? Oh quick yeah. Spells? Sure. Yeah. Any other faves? All right, we'll go with a fifth level spell now. Let's get into like the serious business. Mm-hmm. So this one is called Cloud Kill. I also like this one. Great. Um, you create a 20 foot radius sphere of poisonous yellow green fog centered on a point you choose within range. The fog spreads around corners. <laughs> it lasts for the duration or until a strong wind disperses the fog ending the spell. And it's heavily obscured. Um, so... What happens if you're in the fog, you have to do a constitution saving throw. You're pretty much choking. And you have to take 5d8 poison damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. Creatures are affected even if they hold their breath or don't need to breathe. (laughs) So it's just like a gross, seeping, nasty fog. Uh. So the vapors are like heavier than air and they sink to the lowest level of the land. It's like a nasty, gross mm. fog that does damage. It's chemical warfare. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just like chemical warfare. I don't gas. think there's yeah, any... It's uh, just mustard gas. I don't think there's any sort of, um, like, a, like status effect, uh, like, that makes me more anxious than when some when poison gets introduced. Uh, yeah. It's like yeah. somebody could In come any- at me with a, a big, sharp sword, and I'm like... Oh yeah, whatever. Let's do it. But if I'm like, if I find out, oh, somebody has poisonous status effects that they can inflict Any on you, I'm like, RPG huh. that has a poison component or like a uh, leaves constant damage. I definitely remember like going back as a kid when the first Pokemon games came out, and your a Pokemon would get poisoned, and you'd leave oh, the battle, no. and then the strobing would happen, and you're like, what's that? And then oh. suddenly, you know. Your Charizard has fainted. He's having oh, no. a nervous breakdown, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh the god, worst. this one. Okay, and is this one like also like fireball, like harder to control, like who's affected by it? Yes. Uh, if you are a sorcerer, you can make it careful. Like you can put little pockets mm-hmm. around your friends. But if you're a wizard, you cannot fix that at all. I mean, based on the chemical warfare thing, <laughs> I I think we're we're probably going with Slytherin on this one. Like it's, it's pretty rough. <laughs> like it's yeah, pretty it's gross. Like time to end this sort of thing. Oh god. Like. Ugh. Sorry to you Slytherins that we are leaning into the like, hey, (laughs) purist sort of (laughs) bullshit that happened. And Germany introduced both mustard gas and Zyklon B as far as like shitty stuff, Mm -hmm. shitty stuff. Yeah, I I can definitely imagine if you're playing like a a more evil sort of wizard that's or sorcerer. That's like that's what you're gonna be busting out. Yeah, and that's like a it's like a really foul move. More yeah. so, than, yeah. Especially because you said even characters that can't breathe are affected by yes. it. Yes, like and <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just, just terrible. It's just doom. Yeah, it's uh, just terrible. All right, Slytherin sorted. Yeah, bad gas. Bad gas. <laughs> What's uh, up next? So this one. This is going to be a hard one to sort, I think, because it's really interesting. And I haven't gotten to use this one yet, but it's Ooh. really cool. Um, it's called Contact Other Plane. So you mentally contact a demigod, the spirit of a long dead sage or some other mysterious entity from another plane. Contacting this extra planar intelligence can strain or even break your mind. When you cast this spell, you make a DC 15 intelligence saving throw. On a failure, you take 66 psychic damage and are insane until you finish a long rest. Whoa. While insane, you can't take actions, you can't understand what other creatures say, you can't read, and you can only speak in gibberish. <laughs> So once you go to rest, you you become better. But on a success, you can ask the entity up to five questions. You must ask your questions before the spell ends. The DM answers each question with one word, such as yes, no, maybe, never, irrelevant, or unclear. In a one-word answer, if a one-word answer would be misleading, the DM, DM might instead offer a short phrase as an answer. So pretty much you can contact a magic eight ball, a magic eight ball that will tell you what you want to know, but you might mess it up and go insane for a day. That seems like a huge gamble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I, I mean, this is a level five spell, you said? Yes. This seems like a wildly unwise, like, thing to do unless I guess you're facing some presumably unpenetrable, like, villainous thing. Right. And you're just, like, searching for weak points. But even then, since it's not, like, like this deity is not going to be answering necessarily in the most clear fashion. Right. Unless you're asking yes or no questions, you might, like, to run that risk right. of just it'd being be like, like, yeah, it'd, it'd um, be like, is the boss through that door? <laughs> Now, maybe I would, and you're just like, God, <laughs> you have to be so confident in your abilities that I would say that you have to have a pretty huge ego in order to even feel confident trying this. I would probably. So you're taking it a step back to I the w- caster I would prob- themselves. I would probably uh, disqualify Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs for that reason, because I, you know, my working my working hunch about these houses is are some people operate from a place of ego and some some people don't. But. I would also say curiosity is a huge trait of Ravenclaws and this is and tapping into this particular deity it like you're seeking answers. Right. So like this is this is going to the library to take out a book and the book either contains the exact answers you need or crippling madness. <laughs> right. yeah, I guess so. You know, I guess of all the houses, Ravenclaws would be the ones willing to lose their minds in the pursuit of knowledge. Mhm. So, I think were you initially were then. you initially going Slytherin? I was going to say maybe Slytherin only because like it's such a powerful spell and it seems like something that people would be hesitant to try. Mhm. Even but, if they were powerful. But I do think is it Correct me if I'm wrong. Ego is also something that drives Ravenclaw. Yeah, like I said, uh, oh, I probably misspoke a second. Yeah, I, I, I think that Hufflepuffs and Gryffindors operate more from like they're motivated by what can help the greater good, like the mm-hmm. whole community. The whereas others. Slytherins and Ravenclaws operate from a place of like how can this further my interests, my mm-hmm. own, my my individual interests. 
Yeah. So it's not necessarily a good or bad thing. It's just like what what do you uh you know prize more in terms of like community or self preservation? Mm-hmm. I think. I mean, I just really now like my uh library checkout scenario. Yeah. Of no, like I- just opening. <laughs> it, it's it's basically getting it's not well not exactly but it's the book of the dead and just being like I'm gonna read from this what could possibly go wrong <laughs> and the answer is most things yeah I would say it was Ravenclaw for sure who all right Hooray. any yeah. uh, any other good ones we can do some lower levels or we can just skip right to ninth level oh let's skip to ninth <laughs> yeah, let's level get to the, let's let's wrap up with some big right. boys <laughs> this this spell is probably one of the most powerful spells in D and D and it's insane. So this is called Wish. So Wish is the mightiest spell a mortal creature can cast. It actually Whoa. just says it. Just like just lays it on the table. Just dicks out. By simply speaking aloud, you can alter the very foundations of reality in according with your desires. Oh the my basic goodness. use of this spell is to duplicate any other spell of eighth level or lower. You don't need to meet any requirements in that spell, including costly components. Well, whatever, that's all nonsense. But you can create an object of up to twenty five thousand gold points or gold, gold points, gold pieces in value that isn't a magic item. You can allow up to twenty creatures that you can see to regain all hit points. You can grant up to ten creatures that you can see to resist damage any type. You can grant up to ten creatures you can see immune to a single spell. You undo a single recent event by forcing a reroll of any roll made within the last round. So you can time travel. You can time travel. You, reality oh, reshapes itself to accommodate the new result. You might be able to achieve something beyond the scope of the above examples. State your wish to the DM as precisely as possible. So pretty much you tell the DM what you want to do. Like you can, like, you can do anything. You mm-hmm. can tell them what you want to do and if they allow you, you can do anything anything but it's the the stress of casting the spell to produce any effect other than duplicating another spell weakens you um you take 1d10 necrotic damage per level of that spell oh and you said that was like the the more serious kind of damage yeah yeah in addition your strength drops to three which is nothing (laughs) like right you can't move um and for each of the days that you spend resting and doing nothing more than light activity your remaining recovery time decreases by two days uh, finally, there's a 33% chance that you are unable to cash wish ever again if you suffer this stress. Okay. Oh, man, that's so wild. it's pretty much just like it fixes a cataclysmic event. So I just came up with like what I think would be a baller sort of cinematic move mm. as a caster, which would be if for some reason you're facing off against a creature or I guess boss or mm. something that is magic immune and you cast wish to change your like class. Oh yeah. Maybe you could. It depends on the DM, but you could. Yeah. Like, so just be like, I want to be like, keep my level and change to like a barbarian. Yeah. So like in but that your moment, strength would be crippled and only if, if only if you failed. Yeah. So yeah, I, that sen- could backfire really. So badly. the scenario is like this guy's trying to like change classes and basically Gandalf themselves from gray yeah. to white. Yeah. But also not go from gray to white, but like sorcerer to barbarian. Mm. And then a- they're able to like take on the boss. Like what a, if it would be it, crazy. If it worked, it would be so dope as like everybody at the table, like on that roll, just be like, ah! It'd be pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, like, this, is it's, a, this is like a butterfly effect monkey's paw sort of situation, yeah. I imagine, yeah. in a lot of cases, right? Because even yeah. if you succeed and you don't have like those effects happen, it could still like change the course of effects in a way that you don't necessarily want, right? Yes. Yeah. Like it depends on, it's all up to the DM on how they want it to affect it, but you pretty much gain like, like the power to change reality. You're God for whatever. Yeah, and it has horrible concept, possible horrible consequences. Right. I would not fuck with it, and I don't think any other Hufflepuff would. No, no, no. no. Hufflepuff wouldn't. Ravenclaw wouldn't. It's, it's either. Too, it's too unpredictable for Ravenclaw. It's either a Gryffindor or a Slytherin, and mm-hmm. I'm probably leaning towards Gryffindor. Yeah, Gryffindors are so dumb. They would do it immediately. Yeah. They would just be like, I can get rid of the Dark Lord. And this I is can like, do well, it. you're dead now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that Harry Potter would just like immediately do it and not even know what he was doing. I mean, like he kind of did in the fact that he like knew the prophecy and was like, I'm still going to face Voldemort. And then 
died and then came back. Whoa, and then, spoiler you know, Sorry. Alert. I got upset with the end of that book, so I just stopped halfway through. <laughs> sorry, I just... No, no, I, I know the ending. I was just like, I'm not feeling this. I like the first four books a lot, and it was my childhood. What is happening? All right. Goblet of Fire is so good. Yo, yeah, but uh, if like you don't like the the direction it was going in, don't ever read Cursed Child. Oh no! Oh, oh yeah, what a that's train right. Wreck. You did you did that cold reading of it? Yeah, oh. man. I because I'm not very familiar with Her- the Harry Potter series, ironically. Yeah. But uh, I did, I was like obsessed with it, so I know a lot yeah. about Harry Potter. <laughs> I, I barely know anything about the series, but I do know just based on like the quality of the writing. Because I guess Rowling wasn't like the main writer on these plays. No. It's abysmal. Oh, man. They yeah. should have done use this wish to go back <laughs> and never produce this play. Right. And on that, I feel with with dealing with arguably the most impressive spell that can be cast, yeah. uh, I would like to thank you, Holly Conrad, for joining us on the Sorting Hat podcast. Mm-hmm. Thanks for having me. If Absolutely. I could cast a wish, it would be having you back. Aw. <laughs> Aw. Uh, where can people find more of you? So you can find me, Holly Conrad, uh, on Twitter and Commander Holly on Twitch and YouTube. I always, I know they're switched. It's you just fine. It's fine. Um, I stream every Tuesday. Uh, if you guys want to watch my D and D game, it's Tuesdays from four to six. Um, we're Pacific going standard time, Pacific standard time. Yes. On twitch.tv slash D and D. So Dungeon Dragons, mm. uh, Twitch. And it's super cool. And they also have it on their YouTube channel. So if you want to catch up and see me run away from stuff, like <laughs> it's just like a cool, it's just like, I am so emotionally invested in this game. I just like want other people to enjoy it. So I'm oh, just sure. like, please enjoy this game. Uh, we're going to go on like a short break. I think we go on like a month break and we come back for season three. So that's very exciting. Exciting. And and if any of what you've heard in this uh, session sounds interesting, obviously the the world of D&D is starting to open up a lot more to, as Reed has termed it, the normies. So Mm -hmm. like check out the stream that Holly's on or just start doing some of your own research and maybe you can get a party together to. I didn't have people to play with for a very long time. I just read the books (laughs) and played video games. Uh, if you want to uh, do other things besides play Dungeons and Dragons, like maybe talk to us, let us know how you felt about this episode or any episodes before or ones that you want to hear, you should definitely reach out to us. You can um, find Michael Verity at Bel- Belated Media uh, on Twitter, and you can uh, find me at That Dang Dingus. Uh, and also, Michael, where can they find us, you know, as far as like uh, listening to more episodes and reviews? Man, we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, I think just about. If you search Sorting Hat Podcast, there is an avenue which you can listen to it. Obviously, we'd also love you to leave us a review for any of those places because top mark ratings bump us up on the charts so more people can discover us and join in the sorting goodness. You can also write to us at sortinghatpodcast at gmail.com if you've got suggestions, comments, complaints, uh, love letters, and poetry for us. Uh Thank you all so much for listening, and we will sort with you later.